Please be seated. Listen to the words of Jesus. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My father's house has many rooms. My father would prefer many mansions. If that were not so, I would have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that where I am, there you may be also. Jesus goes on to say, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before long, the world not, will not see me anymore, but you will see me. And because I live, you will leave, live also. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give you as the world gives you. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Amen. The message in a word from the Apostle Peter, from the message version that says this, what a God we have. And how fortunate we are to have him, the father of our master Jesus. And because Jesus was raised from the dead, we have been given a brand new life and have everything to live for, including a future in heaven. And that future starts 
now. God is keeping a careful eye over us and the future. And the day is coming when all who are his will have it all. Life healed and whole. Amen? Just pretend you're Pentecostals. Amen. Today we celebrate the life of such an incredible man. A man that each one of us loved in so many various ways and capacities. A husband, a dad, a papa, a brother, an uncle and a friend. And today we celebrate the sure and certain hope of the Christian, the true disciple of Jesus, the friend of Jesus that Ian Smith, my dad, was. That he has received his future in heaven of eternal life. He has received his reward. He has received his well done and his warm welcome. Our tears today are because we'll miss him so very much. Because we loved him. And he loved all of us. But our smiles today, our smiles today, our rejoicing today that he is with the Lord and he has been made whole. And those of us who are part of that family of God will see him again one day. Hallelujah. Let's take a moment to invite Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, to, to bless us with his presence here today. To give us comfort and strength through the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your incredible grace, mercy and love that you have lavished upon each one of us. We thank you for your precious son, the Lord Jesus. We thank you for your comforter, the Holy Spirit. And we pray that you would bless each one of us today with your presence here as we would remember your servant, your friend, your disciple, Comfort our hearts that are sore because we miss him. But encourage and lift our spirits to know that he is safe with you. May our rejoicing be reflected with the rejoicing in heaven at his presence with the angels and the saints up there. We ask that those who are watching with us online would know a real sense of your presence with them. And we thank you that they have been able to join with us. We pray that this will be a special day. A day that we will remember for a very long time. And to you, and to you alone be all the glory for a life well lived, a race well run, and a servant that you were so pleased with. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. It's true to say that my dad's deepest and probably his most anticipated ambition was to meet his saviour. We would sing in the car whether we were going to church or whether we were going on holiday, our family favourites, what a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see when I look upon his face, the one who saved me by his grace. And with two hands on the wheel, because he was a pretty safe driver for most of his life, not in the last few years, he would say, harmonies, boys, when he takes me by the hand and leads me to the promised land. What a day, glorious day that will be. He would, we would sing songs like, I've got a home in glory land that outshines the sun way beyond the blue. 
or when we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. It would even drum up some old tune that he and his brothers and an old pal used to sing. There is a land that is fairer than day. He used to play that so often that the tape wore out on the machine. And David and I know that song with wonky bits in it because it was stretched. In the sweet by and by, we shall meet on that beautiful shore. But one of his all-time favourites was the hymn that we are about to listen to, because obviously with these current restrictions, we're not allowed to sing, and there are, this is a room full of singers, worshippers of the Lord, face to face with Christ my Saviour, face to face, what will it be? Let's listen to this song as it's played for us now. I can just picture my dad behind the pulpit at Victoria Hall, waving his hands to keep you all in time. You might have all been in time, but wherever his hands were going, well, only the Lord knows 
but he gave it plenty behind that pulpit um, and leading the singing, and he would have been praising along with you, face to face with Christ my Saviour. I'm going to invite my uh, Uncle Gordon to come and bring a brother's tribute. Thank you, Gordon. This is not a sermon, by the way. <clears throat> it's a tribute. For most of my life, I've been truly blessed to have two brothers whom I deeply respected and loved. Billy, who was called home with the Lord on the 3rd of March, 2019. Ian, being called home 24th of January, last month. We had very loving parents, affectionately known as Bill and Rosabelle, who brought us up with Christian values and who were very strong in their faith. They loved singing too when they went out singing duets. My mother, in my opinion, had the best alto voice in the whole of Scotland. We were brought up in a tenement flat in Deniston, the east end of Glasgow, and the three of us shared the same bedroom. And you can imagine the fun that brought, arguing who would tidy the room and who would make the beds. And also we had to take turns in washing the stairhead stairs. During our early school years, we attended, the three of us, uh, with our grandparents down in a village in Strone which is in the Holy Loch. Not the most exciting place to be, but we had great times together during the whole of the school holidays. As a family, we attended a Gospel Hall, Wesleyan Street, off of Gallagate in Glasgow, and we eventually moved to Ebenezer Hall in Bristol, where we've met most of our, our friends. Ian, like Billy, his reputation went before him. And I've said this before, they both attended the Whitehill Senior Secondary School. And when I was transferred there from the junior secondary, when my math teacher found out who my brothers were, she almost collapsed. And when I assured her there was no more of us coming, she was quite relieved. That is true, by the way. Ian became a Christian at a very early age of nine, when he received the Lord Jesus into his life. But in his teens, he joined the Boys Brigade, and after a week away, he came back and he recommitted his life to Jesus. And that was a turning point, a significant turning point in his life. Ian eventually met Isabel, and I have a wee note here, I'm not too sure if it was love at first sight, but uh, I think it might well have been. It was for Dan. It was for Of course, as I was saying. And they were married on the 12th of June, 1964. They would have been married for 57 years come this June. Ian became a preacher of the gospel and developed a great passion to reach out and share the gospel with others. He became passionate for evangelism, even to the point that he considered being a full-time evangelist. Now, in his early working career, Ian worked as an amateur winder with a company called British Electrical Repairs Limited, for short, known as Beryl. He was never ashamed to share his faith or the gospel with his colleagues, and this had a significant impact on one of his colleagues, Charlie Hagan. And through time, Charlie committed his life to Christ. Charlie had a sister who's with us today, Eleanor, and through his witness and testimony, she decided to go through the Emmaus Bible course with her Ian, and she, resulting in her, also came to faith. Now, why I've mentioned this about Charlie Hagan, this had a significant impact on us personally, because Charlie eventually met Margaret, then Patrick, got married, and had two lovely daughters, one of which, Joyce, 
married our son and produced four of our lovely six grandchildren. As brothers, we, along with our very, very close friend and brother, Bob Craig, we decided to form a gospel quartet called the Torchbearers. We had a fantastic time being together, serving the Lord and singing and preaching. The only thing about Ian preaching was that he always completely ignored the clock and very seldom did he finish on time. We had fun moments. On occasion, Ian was a bit of a gentleman and he decided to give way to others on the platform. He moved his seat, but unfortunately he moved the wrong way and he fell off the platform. <laughs> so what did Ian do? Got up, brushed himself down, preached the gospel, ignored the clock and spent over his time. But that was Ian. During the last 60s to mid 80s decade, Ian was very much involved in the Dalhousie Street, Sucky Hall Street open air ministry as part of a team. Almost every Saturday preaching the gospel. So that particular area was a very hot spot for nightclubs. And many would stand and listen to the gospel being preached. Now, Ian was involved in several different ministries. I'll give mention a few to you. He was involved with Operation Mobilisation, known as, as OM, and the Scottish side of things, working alongside George Verdra and Peter Maiden. He was involved in the Scottish Counties Evangelistic Movement, known as SCEM. He was also part of the executive committees that were involved in the Billy Graham Crusades, both at Celtic Park and in Murrayfield. Dick Saunders and Louis Palau Crusade, Ian was involved in the background for that. He was also involved in Tell Glasgow About Jesus, um, uh, way, way back, I don't know when that would have been, but um, where every home in Glasgow was given a gospel tract and a Bible invitation. He was also involved in Soar 84, I'm not too sure what that was, but he was heavily involved in that. He was involved in organising <coughs> Walk for Jesus rallies through the Glasgow city centre. He was involved too in the East End Rendezvous in Shiloh Hall in Glasgow, which many of us were involved in, and we had some fast, some fast, some fast, fantastic times. He spent several years in leadership, being a church elder in his own church in Victoria Hall in Langside in Glasgow. He was also one of the founders of the project called Every Home for Christ, where the goal was to reach every home in Scotland with a gospel track and an invitation for a Bible course. And this vision was completed just shortly before Ian passed away. Sadly, through his lifetime, Ian had a few serious health issues, none less than having to have a quadruple bypass. But being Ian, he pressed on and faithfully kept serving his Lord. However, over the last three or four years, Ian probably spent more times in hospital than dead at home with the last 14 months of his life in care. And could I personally thank the staff in Lindsay Suite at Acaria Gardens for the care, the compassion, mm -hmm. and the love and the attention they gave not only to Ian, but to the family. We look back, you know, in many happy and fun times together serving the Lord as brothers. And the memory of both Ian and Billy will remain with me until we are reunited together. I came across a letter that Ian wrote to me back in 2007. I just found it a few days ago. And he signed the letter, Ian, your brother, the crazy one. <laughs> Ian was full of mischief and fun and I could spend all day talking about his mischievous side. But you know, thinking about Ian, two verses of scripture came to my mind. Romans chapter one, verse 16. I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. Philippians chapter three, Verses 13 and 14. But 
but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining to what is ahead. I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenwards in Christ Jesus. Ian was a very loving and devoted husband, father, father-in-law, grandfather, brother and friend, an example to all. But above all of that, he remained faithful, passionate and a committed servant of the Lord. Could I just leave a verse with the family today for Isabel, for Stephen, Elizabeth, for David, Elaine, for all the grandchildren, Mark, Annie, Sarah, Sarah's husband, Callum, Samuel, Bethany, Hannah, and all who knew and loved Ian. It's a verse of encouragement as you look forward to the days ahead. You know, one of the words I've heard so often in the media these days is the word hope. 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 And Romans chapter 15, verse 13 says this. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to just finish with what maybe some of you all know, what my favourite film was, The Gladiator. And when Maximus Corellius marched his men into battle, he said these words, what you do in life echoes mm -hmm. in eternity. Yeah. And I know that Ian will have heard these words. Well done. Mm -hmm. Good and faithful servant. Welcome. Amen. Thank you. For now, we feel the ache of parting, burdened with the pain of sad goodbyes. Yet we cling to that great hope He's promised of a glad reunion in the sky. Where the streets of gold welcome weary souls, all the grateful drink from the crystal string. Peace forevermore, troubles is 
And the only thing that's missing there is tears. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. If you listen close, you'll almost hear it. Oh, the melody that's rising sweet of the faithful saints gone on before us, gathered safely round our Savior's feet. From the crystal stream, peace forevermore, troubles disappear. And the only thing that's missing there is tears. Every heart may hold every eye. The only thing that's missing there is tears. Hi. Um, many of you have heard of Corrie Den Boom, the, the concentration camp survivor who went all over the world proclaiming the love of God, the forgiveness of Jesus Christ, and the ways in which we can find eternal life. On one occasion, she made a statement which reads, when I enter that beautiful city and the saints all around me appear, I hope that someone will tell me it was you who invited me here. Louis Palau notes that when we get to heaven, the joy it will be to see those who we have led to faith in Jesus Christ, or people who we have witnessed being led, those who we have supported and prayed for. One of the great joys of heaven, Corrie Denham says, will be people coming up and saying, it was because of you that I heard the good news. It was because of you that I repented and received Jesus Christ. It was because of you and your telling of the gospel that I'm here in heaven today. And if we're going to reach this world and work in our generation, then we must obey the Great Commission that asks us to go out into all the world and preach the good news to all creation. This is how my papa led his life, and this is how my father currently leads his. I just hope that this is how I'll be able to live mine. Thank you, Annie. Thank you, Uncle Gordon. It would be easy for me to use the time that I have allotted myself, having gained one characteristic, at least of my dad's, that I don't care about the clock either. I could use that time to tell you lots of funny stories and funny moments. Growing up with Ian William Smith, or IW, as he would sometimes announce himself to the unsuspecting recipient of the phone call, I have, after all, known him my entire life. And I have, along with my younger brother, been blessed with the father of fathers. When God was handing out dads, he handpicked this incredible man 
to be my dad and to be his dad. He handpicked him for our mum. And together they have lived their lives with the singleness of goal to glorify God and to serve his plans and purposes for their lives. So instead of just little stories, I want to share with you about the man. I want to share with you about the message of the man and I want to share with you about the mission of the man. Ian Smith was a devoted man. Devoted to his wife, he adored her, he, he longed to be with her, and whatever they were doing together, he just loved that. He longed these last two years in hospital or at Arcadia Gardens, whether he had Riley and Katie and all the team looking after them, the only visit that he was really looking forward to was his Isabel. He would sometimes get a wee bit irritated when she was late. Isabel, he would call out, looking for his beauty. The smile that would come across his face when she walked into that room was priceless. And with a smile, if not always with words, he would express his love and devotion for her. He was devoted to his two sons too. He was admittedly always a busy man, not with trivial activity like pastimes but constantly active in so many things but he was devoted in investing in his boys teaching and instructing us in in many many different things he was devoted to to his, his grandchildren too you'll have seen some photographs particularly of mark and sarah before one of his illnesses, where he was the papa who played on the floor. He was the papa that rolled about with Paul Martin and with Gillian and carrying on. My dad loved a good carry on. Some of you would have been victims, I mean participants in his carry on. Whether he tied your shoelaces together or whether he pulled the arm of your coat out or whether he stuck hairbrushes underneath your duvet for you to be greeted by when you went to your bed at night time. I do believe that Gordon Smith, Billy Smith and Bob Craig were a very bad influence on my dad. My dad was rather asthmatic when I was younger, but despite that, and after some very long days in business, he would find the time to run behind my bike, holding the saddle, calling out, that's it. That's it. You've got this. You've got this. Keep going. You've got this. And as my legs were going like the clappers, his voice was getting quieter and quieter. And I would realize that I was riding all by myself. And dad was pulling out his inhaler to draw a large few breaths. It wasn't the first time and it wouldn't be the last time that my dad would say to me, you've got this. He was an encourager. Riding the bike was just one thing, but he instructed and taught us on reading our Bibles and developing our prayer lives and our devotional lives. He, he taught us on how to serve our master, the Lord Jesus Christ, who became our saviour for me on the 19th of September 1974 with mum and dad there and not long after for David too. He would teach us how to pray in our Saturday devotions when he taught his boys to get on their knees before the Lord and bring everything that was on their hearts to them, to him. He taught us how to read our Bibles. And when we got older and he would be taking me to, to school before he would go to business, we would have daily prayers with him. My dad would commit quotations for a job to the Lord. He would commit his engineers to the Lord. That he would watch over. He committed everything to God in prayer. My dad would go on to champion not only me, but my brother 
and support us in prayer throughout our entire lives. He was a man of conviction. He was a man of courage. He was a man of great character. He was a man of great commitment and he was a man of great creativity. He was a devoted man, committed man, a passionate man, an enthusiastic man. He was a loyal man and a true friend. Amen. He was a faithful and committed man, not flighty. He was a man of the utmost integrity, never half-hearted and never lukewarm. Any of you who have had a handshake from my dad at the back of the church, either when you were arriving or leaving, knew that he had a proper handshake. We grew up to call it the brethren handshake. We'd always hold on just for that extra second to make sure he knew and you knew that he cared about you. He would eyeball you just to make sure that when you said, I'm fine, whether you were telling him the truth or not. My dad had two settings, full throttle and then maybe a wee bit of sleep. He gave everything he had to everything that he did. He gave his full attention to whoever was in front of him, to whatever the task was, whatever the mission was, whatever the, the objective was, the goal was, he gave it his everything. And always, regardless of challenges and objectives, even downright opposition, he remained steadfast and resolute to what he believed God had called and asked him to do. He loved to laugh. You will see lots of big smiles and guffaws of laughter in these photographs. His biggest laughs were when the family all got together. My Uncle Billy shaking up and down because Gordon and Bob and Ian were acting like clowns. No change there then, boys. Dad loved to tease and torment, but never with malice. Usually just to let you know that he noticed you. He loved you. He cared about you. I'm convinced that Ian Martin wore slip-on shoes most of his adult life because he didn't want my dad tying his shoelaces together. And they enjoyed so many laughs at other people's expense just because Ian had slip-on shoes. He would, he would make sure that everybody, along with my Aunt Jean, there they were those ones that just were pivotal in making sure that there was so much fun and laughter when we all got together. He was a man of an incredible reputation, not just in, in one church denomination either. He had a reputation of such that, that during a spell when he wasn't too well and he'd asked me to cover um, his speaking engagements for him, I was being introduced as, as the speaker as Ian Smith's son. A few years later, however, when my dad would visit Clacton, when I was the pastor, leading the church there, some in the congregation would say to dad, oh, you must be Pastor Steve's dad. Today I can honestly say, without a word of a lie, that I was proud and am proud to be Ian Smith's eldest son. And I know that my young brother feels exactly the same way. Our dad set high standards. He was a family man. He was a church man. He loved the local church. He loved the local church. He was a man of God. He preached often about heaven, and now he is in heaven. My most compelling vision of dad is, is as an exuberant, passionate animated preacher in the pulpit. He left nothing on the bench. He gave it all every time. He preached the word, not stories. He preached the truth, 
not headlines. It would preach salvation, restoration, and God's intentions for his people and how he has triumphed over their sin and rebellion. The spirit of the message that he preached was that there was comfort in it, that there was joy in it, there was salvation in it, there was restoration in it, there was an urgency in it. He proclaimed it fearlessly in the power and the anointing of the Spirit of God. And on one occasion, among many, he was preaching at Selkirk Street in Hamilton. And there was a young curly-haired fireman sitting in the congregation that night who listened to this passionate, urgent, anointed preaching. And when we were all at my Uncle Bob and Aunt Eleanor's for supper, Dad was taking ages to come back. And when he came back, the beam of the smile on his face and the tears rolling down his face that the Paul Lynch had trusted Jesus Christ as his saviour. As I should say, the Reverend Paul Lynch, who would go on to pastor hundreds of people down just outside of London and now has an itinerant ministry with his wife and children down there in the southeast. Just one occasion... I messaged Paul and he said to me, that night, Stephen, the way your father preached and the way God used him through the power of the Holy Spirit changed the direction of my life forever here on earth and for eternity. Hallelujah. That was the man and that was the message. The last two years of his life, dad would often talk about wanting to go home, but not meaning his home at Berrylands, but his home in heaven. David and I would, during our visits, read to, to Dad and we would pray with him and we would take communion with him. And the last time was just a few weeks ago. I got to have communion with him and Mum. We learned just a week before Dad's journey toward heaven accelerated that his vision that Uncle Gordon mentioned, every home for Christ, had be completed. His mission was accomplished. His earthly race had been run well, serving and fulfilling his master's wishes, plans, and throughout his entire life. On hearing that news, he responded as he had started to do with a huge smile and then a wee cry. He began his final journey towards heaven that would take almost 12 days, looked after by Riley and the team at Arcadia. He would, if he could speak to you today, he would be asking, will you be making the same journey too? The 24th of January 2021, Dad followed Jesus all the way to heaven. He'd been so proactively involved in kingdom ministry all over the country and beyond, but these last 12 days was the journey of a lifetime. From earth to heaven, to the throne room of God, and Jesus said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. My dad always expressed unconditional love for us, for all of us, all of the time. For he was totally perfect to us as far as we were concerned. Well, except when he would take the most carnation milk and leave David and I to squabble over the rest. Or when he would cheat at family games and hide cards for Uno and Pitt behind Bob Craig's back so that he could win. But to be completely honest with you, he was the best dad, the best friend, the best mentor, the best companion a man could ever hope for. Dad, you knew exactly how your boys felt about you and how much we love and adore you. Thank you for the legacy. Thank you for being our dad. To God be all the glory. We're going to listen to another song of dads and then Paul is going to come and share with us. We are going to go over our time. I'm sure the undertakers won't mind that too much. It doesn't take us too long to get to Rutherglen. But we'll play this song and then Paul will come and share the message of the Lord with us.
privilege to be able to share just a small portion of God's word with you uh, today on this day. Unclean was a role model to many. We're going to read from Philippians chapter 3 and I'm so glad that Uncle Gordon read those verses because we're going to follow up a little bit later in that chapter. And as we think about the Apostle Paul, 
Just like the Apostle Paul, Uncle Ian was an example to follow. And being an example and doing so, he inspired others to do the same. This was not of his own doing, but because his life was devoted to and centered around Christ. He was a role model to many as he looked to Christ each day. A legacy left behind because he lived with eternal purpose and eyes fixed on Christ. Philippians chapter 3, verse 17, Paul writes this. He says, join together in following my example, brothers and sisters. And just as you have us as a model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. For I, as I have often told you before and now tell you again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction, their God is their stomach, and their glory is in their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things, but our citizenship is in heaven, and we eager, eagerly await a saviour from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. The Apostle Paul tells us here in these verses to follow his example, join together in following my example. He encourages the reader to follow him, to follow his lifestyle. He is showing them the, the way to live. Now, this isn't perfect, flawless, religious living, but rather he demonstrates his faith in action. Paul, just before these verses, as Uncle Gordon read out, he talks about how he has no confidence in his own flesh. What he means is that he has no confidence in the things that he can do. He has no confidence in his own actions. He has no confidence in the things that people would look to and see as holy and good. And for Paul, as a Jew, that would be being born into the right family or doing the right things. Paul says, I now consider all these things as rubbish, as garbage, as loss. Because Paul knows that the only way to God the only way to eternal life, the only way to find peace with God and forgiveness is through Jesus. Salvation and eternal life can only be found through Jesus. Paul states, I have not accomplished this heavenly perfection that only Jesus can give, but rather I press on towards that goal. I fix my eyes, not on this world, but on eternity. Paul's faith was not in himself. It was in Jesus. Paul trusted in God, not in his own actions. But then he says, follow my example. Not all the good stuff that I do, but my faith, trust in God as I do. Take as a model the ones who live like this. Look to them and see how they lived. Keep your eyes on those people and do what they do and have that faith that they have. See how they handled life in all its ups and downs and high points and low points and sickness and in health and joyous days and depressed days. Watch how they react. Watch how they live. Take their lives as an example. Where are they getting their strength from when trouble comes? Where are they finding their peace in the midst of trials? Who is it that is sustaining them through every season of life? I can guarantee you those people of faith, Ian Smith did not find his strength in anything from this world, but he was what Paul would call a citizen of heaven and found his strength and peace in God and in him alone. Take those people of faith as your example, model your life on their faith. Let those citizens of heaven show you the way. We all need people to show us the way. Whether we realize it or not, we learn 
from those around us. We learn from those that go before us. Whether we like it or not, we all learn from the example that is shown to us. We copy what we see. We learn from our parents, as we've heard in our tributes. And we teach our children, whether we realize it or not. Traits, attitudes, beliefs. Whether they like it or not, Stephen and David have inherited something from their dad. And I'm glad it's not just his hairline. Sorry, I need to laugh, otherwise I'll not be able to get through. I'm glad that's not the only thing he passed down. Why he passed down a legacy. We've heard before, we've heard today, he set an example to follow. Just as Paul encourages the reader to follow his example, Ian Smith set an example to follow. Ian Smith was a role model to many, including me. And you know what? He was the best kind of role model. Because he was the kind of role model that you didn't even realize he was being a role model. As I look back on my life and see how Ian Smith discipled me, what he taught me, it wasn't with the, the latest programs, it wasn't with strategies, it wasn't with clever thinking or planning. It was every day, every week, the way that he poured his life out to not only God and the ministry in his church, but to family and friends and those around him. I knew straight away when I was asked to speak to thee, I knew straight away that I should share these verses. Because Ian Smith was a man who set an example. Within his own family, he set an example. Happily married for 56 years, two sons, six grandchildren. Ian Smith set an example as a loving husband, a devoted dad, and one proud papa. Of course, as we've heard already, that came with a fair share of laughs and mischief and tormenting thrown in. I can see it right now. I have to share the house that one Sunday, uh, one, uh, I have to share the story that in our house, in the Martin household, one Sunday night, as we were all drifting off to sleep and as usual mum was last to go to bed and as we were all preparing for monday morning and the week ahead drifting off to sleep relaxing after a busy day with church and family and as just as we're drifting off mum gets into bed and uh, in her room and wakes the whole house or the whole street with screams that can't even be described and as I'm just waking up as a 10 year old boy, probably wondering what on earth is going on and what is mum screaming for, what has happened, I can hear that her screaming has now turned into uncontrollable laughter. And all I can hear is dad trying to whisper to her, trying to understand what, what is it, what's happened, what's happened? Shh, is she going to wake the kids? I think she had woken the whole street by that point. And, uh, what it turned out is that in the afternoon, as usual, when Uncle Ian had been over for his chicken dinner, uh, had sneaked upstairs and shoved a whole bunch of stuff under the duvet in Mum and Dad's bed. And Mum had climbed in and what she thought was a rat or a mouse under the duvet turned up out just to be a black, fluffy slipper. <laughs> Once she got her breath back, all I could hear was mum grumbling, see that Ian Smith, he's getting it. Not only with family and friends did he set an example, but he set an example with his faith. He understood what it was to be a citizen of heaven. He knew, like Paul, that anything that he had to boast about was not in his own strength, but was in the grace and goodness of God in his life. He was devoted to the truth 
of the gospel. He had a passion for prayer, and I even heard that there was complaints sometimes in Victoria Hall prayer meeting. When is he going to sit down and give someone else a chance to pray? He had a passion for prayer and to see God move in this nation. He had a passion for those who did not yet know Jesus and wanted them to know the truth of the gospel, as we've heard already today. He had a devotion and commitment to the local church, serving in Victoria Hall as an elder for over 40 years, and of course, preaching around various other churches across, across Scotland. Ian himself looked to other men of faith and followed the example that they set. People like Peter Maiden and George Verwer and the others that have been mentioned. He set a good example. He showed what it was to follow Jesus every day. And even up to the last moments when he couldn't even speak, somehow found a way to ask for scripture to be read. Ian Smith, for many, displayed the way of Christian living. That's what a role model does. A role model shows you the way. Someone like Ian Smith sets an example, shows you the way to go, the way to be a husband, the way to be a Christian, the way to set an example for others. Ian Smith showed others the way, just like the Apostle Paul says, he showed others the way, but here is the fundamental difference and the fundamental thing to not forget that there is a, there is a difference here. Jesus, the Jesus that they built their life on, the one that they pointed to, that Jesus came not just to show us a way, but he came to be the way. He still is the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus came to be the ultimate example and role model. He didn't just show us the way. He said in his own words, I am the way. Uncle Lean, just like the Apostle Paul, knew that his good example was not just about his own actions, but was about his faith in that Jesus, in our Jesus Christ. His example was in his trust that Jesus died on the cross, was buried in the tomb, and three days later rose again. His example was not all about the good way of living and the good things that he'd done, but it was more about his faith that he was a citizen of heaven, that he didn't live just for this world, but had an eternal destiny, that his life was not lived for his own gain, but was a living sacrifice to his God, to Jesus Christ. That was the example that he set before us and that he would encourage us to follow. He would want me to tell you today that if you do not know for a fact that you are a citizen of heaven, if you do not know for certain that you have been forgiven and that you are destined for eternal life, then simply ask. Don't put it off any longer. Today is the day. It's not complicated. Jesus has made it so simple and so easy for us that all we need to do is pray and to ask God to forgive us for the ways that we have done wrong, to receive his forgiveness and to accept him into our hearts, to commit our life to following and obeying Jesus. Imagine just like Ian Smith, your life could be an example to others, not because you could show them a way, but because you know the way, the truth and the life. Ian Smith didn't want to gloat about how holy or good he was. He simply wanted to point people to the way, to Christ, with as much of his life as possible. Today, his heavenly citizenship becomes a reality. And I pray the same for you today. Amen. Thank you, Paul. We're just going to ask the Lord to comfort us as we would go to lay dad to his final resting place here on earth. We want to thank those of you who have joined us online and we pray that God will richly bless you and that everything that you have heard spoken about this man who you knew and loved, that perhaps you lived next to, perhaps you, you met um, on occasion or perhaps you've known him for a very long time. 
may his service today have been a witness to you that he served his master and his plans and purposes. Maybe even today he will serve those plans. And today will be a day that will change your life forever. We're going to have a song played um, that my brother is singing, um, I can only imagine. Um, during this song, the um, attendants will come and take Dad uh, back to the car and we will leave as a family shortly. I want to thank my precious family for being here with us today. As I look around this room, Dad is reunited with many that he loved and adored and served with. And they are dancing in the streets of heaven. And the mansions are full. Let's pray. Father, you are so, so good to us. Your word tells us in Jeremiah 31 that we have to refrain our voice from weeping and our eyes from tears for your work shall be rewarded and there is hope in your future. We thank you that dad has received his reward. We thank you that your servant is with you and with the saints that have gone before. We thank you for the example that he set to each one of us. We thank you that we got to love this incredible man for so long. We thank you that you so loved him that you sent your son to die for him and that he is now with you. Comfort us, strengthen us, give us safe haste to Rutherglen Cemetery. We thank you for the fellowship of the folks here at Cart Calderwood Baptist Church. We thank you for each one. We thank you for Cal. We thank you for all the preparations that went in, and David and Elaine and so many others. We thank you for uh, the attendance from the co-op funeral care. Bless them richly in Jesus' wonderful name. We ask that you would comfort mum and David and I and our families and that we would live out the legacy of Ian Smith here until you call us home or until the trumpet sounds and we shall be caught up together with them in the clouds. To you be all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. I can only imagine what it will be like when I walk by his side. I can only imagine what my eyes will see when your face is before me. I can only imagine. Mm -hmm. Surrounded by your glory, what will my heart feel? Will I dance for you, Jesus, or in all of you be still? Will I stand in your presence, or to my knees will I fall? Will I sing hallelujah? Will I be able to speak at all? I can only imagine. I can only imagine. I can only imagine when that day comes and I find myself standing in the sun. I can only imagine when all I will do is forever, forever worship you. I can only imagine. I can only imagine 
Surrounded by your glory, what will my heart feel? Will I dance for you, Jesus, or in awe of you be still? Will I stand in your presence, or to my knees will I fall? Will I sing hallelujah? Will I be able to speak at all? And I'm surrounded by your glory. What will my heart feel? Will I dance for you, Jesus? Or in all of you be still? Will I stand in your presence? To my knees will I fall? Will I sing hallelujah? Will I be able to speak at all? I can only imagine. I can only imagine. I can only imagine. I can only imagine. I can only imagine what it will be like. I can only imagine. can only imagine what it will be like. I can only imagine when all I will do is forever, forever worship you. I can only imagine Ooh, I can only